for those of you who don't know me, I'm Rebecca Katz. I direct the Center for Global Health Science and Security here at Georgetown. And um, this is uh, the last of our official seminars of the, of the semester, although we will actually have two more events, um, which I can happily tell everybody about um, at the end if you're interested. Um, but today we have Bruce Gellin, who I have a, um, I have like a four paragraph bio that I won't bother to read, but here's the, here's the, the really important stuff. So first, he is an affiliate of our center, which we are delighted about. Um, he is a native of West Hartford, as am I, so these are the, <laughs> the, the really important things. Um, but, you know, the, the things that you actually all care about is he's the president of the Global Immunization at the Sabin Vaccine Institute in, here in Washington. Um, and before that, he was at HHS, where you were deputy assistant secretary um, and, and uh, director of the National Vaccine Program Office. Um, before that, had spent time at NIH, CDC, um, consultant at WHO. He's, he's our guy on vaccines. So we're really, really excited to have him here talking about um, what has become a, a very topical issue. Um, and with that, let me turn it over to Bruce. Thanks. Well, thanks, thanks for being here. It's fun to be in this setting and see lots of familiar people. Actually, I'm, gonna, I'm not even going to turn it over to you yet. Before you do that, it might be helpful. Can we just do a really quick sure. tour de table and everyone just say like, who you are and are you a student? Do you have a job? If you have a job, like, what, is, what is that job? job? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, please, you want to start? Hi, um, my name is Ariel, and I'm a student at Georgetown University. In which program? Um, uh, nursing and Health Studies. Great. I'm Andrew, um, also a student at Georgetown, and I'm a human science major. I'm um, Madeline Cuny, and I'm a student at Georgetown in the biology of global health. Julie Kaplan, I'm the director of the Board on Global Health of the National Academy of Design. I'm Mike Soto, I'm the faculty, and I apologize in advance, I have to leave for something connected with the balloon. <laughs> <laughs> so you're double parked somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, good morning. Alba Vila Jolio, Pan American Health Organization, World Health Organization here in Washington, D.C. Uh, Maeve McCain, I'm going to join Georgetown in about two weeks to work on the Global Health Initiative. Voice Research Associate, Center for Global Health Science and Security. Mary, student at Georgetown Science, Technology, and International Affairs major. I'm Elizabeth Fosman from Harvard University, studying Senate Degree. Olivia Atal, a senior research associate at the Center for Global Health Science and Security here at GU. Nathan Zitro, economic student here at the Center for Global Health Science and Security. Jason Kaplan, I'm a senior medical student. I'll tell you, so that's why I came. I mean, every time I come to Georgetown, <coughs> I'm amazed and impressed by this. That the range of people you get from all kinds of places and disciplines. And that's from the first time there was one of these events to every time. So, so thanks all for coming. So you said this was recently topical. So in my world, it was always topical. <laughs> so that's why I'm here. Yeah, right. um, but actually, I'll tell you, I mean, I, uh, I'm going to tell you a story, but part of this is when I, so I came to Washington in 2002 um, and came to direct what's called the National Vaccine Program Office at HHS, which reports the Assistant Secretary for Health. But 2002 was critical for a couple of reasons. One is that the National Vaccine Program Office had been around for a long time. In the mid-90s, in the, you know, reshaping government, whatever was going on, they said, who needs a coordinating office like this? Let's get rid of it. CDC said, well, you know, it's actually pretty helpful to have that. So it moved to Atlanta. So they, so CDC housed it for, for maybe 10 years. Frankly, it doesn't, when you're supposed to be coordinating across government, based at CDC, everybody else was suspicious. So why is anybody, so they think, well, why is CDC doing this? So it didn't, you know, it, it functioned okay, but not terribly well. And in the post 9-11 era, when vaccines were you know, a big topic. They said, "Don't we have some vaccine people we can do something with, or bring them?" So, so that was the that was the idea of bringing the National Vaccine Program Office back to Washington, 
And it was, that was also, and that's when I came and looked at it. And it's, it's interesting to think about those times because it wasn't clear where, geogra where physically they were going to put it, the park lawn building or someplace where they could put it. And the advice that I got from people around us is insist it be at headquarters, insist you have access to the secretary, or don't come. Because I, I heard all this stuff about, you know, tell her this and that, and where it's like tell the president, you know. And they said, if you're not in the building, it doesn't matter. And, it, and that clearly was the lesson, um, because proximity matters. Because they could always call Tony Fauci, they could always call the CDC, but they could always come and grab me and say, okay, come do this. So it made a huge difference. And even though the National Vaccine Program Office didn't have and still doesn't have a biosecurity agenda, because it had vaccines on the, in the name, it was important and brought into a lot of that. And, I, and, and even though the mandate for the National Vaccine Program Office is much broader, I spent most of my time in that time on this kind of topic. And then came SARS and then came H5N1, so there I was in the middle of it. And so what was gonna be a small 10-person office trying to coordinate across government turned out to be you know, center stage. So timing matters, um, but it was, always, it was always a piece of that. And, and as things, so it was, this was before there was, the, before ASPR existed, so it was all, it was, they were just trying to put it together. A guy named Stuart Simonson, who was at that point Se Secretary Thompson's personal aide, who was his, his, his counselor when he was in Wisconsin, basically ha was running what now is Asper from his, his, his office in the Office of General Counsel, and he got um, D.A. Henderson, who was the smallpox eradicator, and a guy named Phil Russell, who was a retired general. He pulled these people back into service, and they're sitting on his couch. That was the origin of what's Asper and all the things that, that Asper does now. So the timing matters, but um, when, it got, <coughs> this, when it got into the um, the, p the pandemic preparedness part, um, Thompson says to me, he says, well, how come we don't have a national vaccine plan? And I'll get to this in a, in a, at, the, at the end of the talk, but I said, well, part of the problem is that um, it's not only about, va it's, uh, how come we don't have a pandemic plan? I said, well, it's, there's more to this than vaccine. He says, do you think that I care about that? So we need to do it. So I got set off to go <laughs> and sort of put to get pull together the the you know the, the the HHS's pandemic preparedness plan in 2005. The other piece of that was that so HHS is doing this. Are you recording this? Um, so <laughs> HHS is doing this, and we're incubating this giant plan. And at some point, it occurred to us to tell the White House that we're working on this thing because they're so they said, well, that's now the that's the HHS plan. We don't have a national plan. So as we're about to release this thing, they said, well, hold off, because we need a national plan. So they, and a lot of people you know, sort of pulled together, and it was, it was fine, but they, it needed to be a national plan in which the HHS plan can be part of the context. So that left the rest of the, age, the, rest of the agencies, hey, hey, what about us, because this is an all government. So then there, the others were scrambling to try to figure out what is the defense, what's the homeland security, what are these other things, and how do they fit into this picture? longer story. So thank you for having me here. Um, as you'll see, you know, you know, vaccines are central to what I've been doing for a long time, and, I'll, and I'm, the idea here is to sort of show you how it's, how it's central to your world as well. Um, another thing about being in Washington is you can reach out to people who know a lot more than you. Uh, and so I just wanted to acknowledge Nikki Lurie, who I've worked with many, for many, many, also, well, she's from Bloomfield. She's not from West Hartford. So, um, but um, her the husband's a Georgetown town. faculty member. Though, right, well, so okay, we'll so there you have it. So where is he this morning? <laughs> um, but 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 Nikki's now at CEPI, and there's a whole series of CEPI slides which I'll get to. But but thanks to her. So um, global health security is what you do. So I started with this, uh, and I'm not sure. Does anybody know? Did they do this every year? Have top ten global threats? I, I, I I'm not aware of it. I think it's the first time. Um, there's and do you guys do it? The official, we got the official <laughs> WHO response. No, that's the official PAHO yeah, response. PAHO and WHO are only loosely affiliated. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's another lecture. Um, so here are the top, here are these top two. These are not in order, I don't think. But these are not, so, so here's the question for you. Is there, va is there a vaccine story to, to any of these? We'll start at the bottom. We'll do the easy ones. HIV, right? It's clearly a vaccine story. Dengue, sorry. Vaccine hesitancy, clearly. How about weak primary healthcare? Can you, can you come up with something? We'll get back to that. Ebola, obviously. 
AM, AM, AMR, okay? Fragile and vulnerable settings, we'll, we'll, we'll be creative about that one. Um, pandemic, for sure. Non-communicable diseases. Yeah, yeah. okay. Air pollution? Air pollution, no. climate change? Yeah, okay. So there you have it. So, <laughs> a vaccine, so vaccines are central to this whole thing. And if, you, if this was one of these slides, vaccines are in the middle and everybody else is peripheral. So, <laughs> so here are some of the pieces of it. So clearly these are the, the, the less obvious ones about climate change, um, uh, fragile cities and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, weak, and weak systems. The global health, and maybe we should have a side conversation about this where people know more about this than I do. So when they put together, they, the global health security agenda, immunizations was one piece of it. And ironically, what is the, what is the, what's the measure for? Measles. Measles. So how are we doing? <coughs> okay. So from my world, this is the quote, right? So, so if this is all you have is a hammer, the whole world's a nail, so which is why vaccines are central to all of this. So, um, you know, when you think about, this is sort of a standard where, we, where vaccines come from. And, 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 I, and I, when I was at HHS, I probably said this, what I'm going to tell you now, once a day, that there's a vaccine world in a vaccination world, and there's not really an arrow that connects them. They're totally different people. There's sort of an overlap, but they're really different. The language is different, and so that's, and that's often confusing when people talk about the vaccine and vaccination, and probably vaccine hesitancy should be vaccination hesitancy, although there's sometimes it's about a product. So this is the sort of the sequence. People do research, they find stuff, they think this is gonna be interesting, they think they may make some money or have an impact, and this is the sequence. When we put together the National Vaccine Plan in 2010, we worked with, actually Nikki Lurie was the lead at RAND in trying to help us think this through. And they had these things called process maps, which I, not, I call them wiring diagrams. And what they did, and, and you know, it's, it's hard to read this, but the, the, the point of this is it's all connected. And it's like one of these, well, here's why. It's like one of these Rube Goldberg <laughs> things, right? So unless, <laughs> unless it works, unless all the pieces are working, the light is gonna blink at the end. And so the reason I say that is that and this is, this is, and when, when I show this, what happens is people say, well, what's my box? Or, you know, they say, well, surveillance should have a larger font, or the arrows are in the wrong direction. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. I think the point is that there's a lot of pieces to an, a, a vaccine enterprise, a vaccine and vaccination enterprise, and they're all connected directly or indirectly. And unless they're working optimally, it's like gears in an engine, so you're gonna have to, so, my, so I, I often thought about my job as sort of an engineer at HHS is doing tune-ups. The agencies didn't like that so much. Um, and they actually, they, the, I think that my mantra for an office like that was, um, people like coordination, but they don't like to be coordinated, but that's true everywhere. So um, I'm not gonna give you the entire history of vaccination, again, in the context of Global threats, but you know, the, the, there was there were things going on in trying to prevent smallpox a long time ago, long time before Edward Jenner, because and, and clearly smallpox was a huge threat. Wind the clock forward. This is the, you probably know this, but this is the origin of the word vaccine. French vaca is cow, and that's because that's where the this was the first smallpox um, vaccination factory. This is how it was made for a long time. And you probably know this story, but about why there was why cows got into the mix. So the the picture on the right is, is I, I assume this is a milkmaid and not this guy's girlfriend, but don't know. <laughs> um, and the and the, the the milkmaids who were milking cows didn't get smallpox, and the reason they didn't, in retrospect, is that they were exposed to cowpox, and that that gave them immunity against smallpox, and that was the observation that led to. Um, what went on later about the smallpox vaccination. So this is, I mean, it's an unbelievably horrible disease that has now disappeared. Nobody knows that. And it's interesting when you think about, you know, the, the vaccine hesitancy today is largely a problem of the vaccine success because the, the diseases that vaccines prevent have gone away. So the threats doesn't seem there. And the question is, you know, do you need it? Um, it is also interesting that in the middle of smallpox eradication, measles was a co-traveler for lots of reasons. It was, it was, it's the most infectious disease, so, uh, and it had a rash, that clearly not the same kind of lethality, but measles and smallpox were often co-travelers um, in, the, in the fight against them. And then, as everybody knows, smallpox was eradicated. Um, in 1997, there are all kinds of pieces about this. I think this is, 
some anniversary. Or there, somebody was telling me about trying to get a postage stamp, and who knows the politics of getting postage stamps, but <laughs> there you have it. So there's always a, there's always a you know a push for you know for a vaccine when there's a problem that is potentially vaccine preventable. There's a push for it, um, and people. This is the one when we were at CDC, and had media training. We must have seen this Margaret Heckler clip a zillion times of don't go and promise things that you can't deliver. Um, so poor Margaret Heckler was there talking about we're going to have it. Once the virus was discovered in 1984, she said, "Okay, we'll have a we'll have a vaccine in two years." So that's that's still needs some help. In 2000, NIH. I mean, NIH this is not anybody's fault, but they're you know trying to to move the needle on this. So in 2000, the the, vac, the NIH established the Vaccine Research Center with a focus on HIV. They subsequently have have they, they do many things. Um, but Ebola, Ebola and influenza are among the top things that they're doing now. And this was named after, people know who Dale Bumpers was? Betty Bumpers? So Dale Bumpers was a um, senator from Arkansas who was a champion of this, and, his, and probably because of his wife. His wife, Betty, is, I think she's still alive, is a nurse, uh, and, she was, and she was a real champion of immunization. She then got all the governor's wives involved in promoting immunization, um, including uh, the governor of Georgia, Rosalind Carter, who then became the first lady. And probably the first time, you know, they moved to Washington, I'm sure that Betty was knocking on her door and said, hey, listen, we got to do something with immunization, and start an organization called Every Child by Two. And now I think it's called Vaccinate Your Family or something like that. But that it's been an organization that they have led uh, for a long time, and clearly it's, it's leadership matters. Um, she, she dies last year. That is Oh, okay. Thanks. Um, so let me get more into the into the subject. So there is a so I talked about smallpox. I sort of alluded to anthrax in the post 9/11 days. Um, but the question is, what are the other disease threats that we're worried about? So WHO has this blueprint um, for priority pathogens, which they revisit every year. Um, and I'll get into that in a second. But this is the list essentially. This is the current list. Um, and then there's disease X which I'll also get to. What I found amazing, when you go look at this, um, and I, I was part of one of these discussions early on, because they ask a lot of people, what should we do? So look at this, so they start this, they start with all diseases and pathogens as the starting place, and then winnow it down to the list you saw, and there's a process, so they have this process. In here is this thing called the MCDA algorithm. Any idea what that is, you heard of that? It's, so it's, a, it's it's, it's jargon, so multi-criteria decision analysis. When you have a zillion things you know, in the mix, how do you figure out how to prioritize? And so it's sort of a weighting system. Um, it's a way you can say what's, impo what's important, and it depends what you're, it's a longer discussion, and maybe that's something we should do another time, is, but how do you, how do you figure out what's, what's the top thing? Is it based on morbidity? Is it based on security? Is it based on a whole range of things? You know, would you put antimicrobial resistance in the mix and then how that would weight what's important? So they go through this exercise with some kind of a tool, it's a weighting tool that, that then get, gets up, you know, comes up with this list. So this is the current list of targets for which, um, you know, vaccines would be helpful for, for countries, for regions, and for global health security. Um, so there are some of the Nikki Lurie slides from CEPI, but, you know, part of the problem is that this, it takes a long time and you see this. Whenever there's a problem, someone says, where's the vaccine? And that could be either, you know, well, it's, it's, it, it, there's a supply problem if the vaccine exists, or there's a science problem if it doesn't exist. And go to the bottom, you know, it takes 15 or 20 years or longer, you saw the AIDS vaccine, to develop a vaccine. So that's a big problem if you've got an emergency. Um, so the question is, how do, you get, how do you get ahead of that? Or how do, you even, how do you narrow that down a little bit? And then you have this problem like we have with Zika or others or MERS or, or SARS that these things show up, it's a big problem, and then they go away for a variety of reasons. Sometimes you understand them, sometimes you don't. And there's still people in the lab working on the vaccine, which you know, is a little bit out of sync with when you need it. So the question is, how can you get, how can you get it for public health emergencies, how can you get a vaccine ahead of the curve rather than behind the curve? Because for all other vaccines, that's what we do. They're, they exist, and you give them to people. The reason that the timing of vaccination for childhood is as it is, is a combination of will the immune system work, and is it in front of when 
people are going to most likely experience those diseases. Right. Also, how, how do you test it if there's no outbreak going on? Right. So there, that's that's so so we'll get into the SEPI part, but that's that's a huge problem. So you can test, you know, it's a complicated question. You can test it so far, but you can't really figure out if it works in human populations broadly without disease. So the, and and there's and, and we're not smart enough to know which immune markers say, oh, you're there. There is a discussion, and and the, the and the FDA and I assume other regulators have ways that they think about this. There's something called the animal rule, where you can test them in animals. But immunologists' favorite line is mice lie, so <laughs> you're not going to rely on mice. Um, and it's a question of whether or not we can we can figure out someday um, which which immune markers tell us you're protected, because you can measure all kinds of stuff, but so what if it doesn't protect you? So that's 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 a critical question. Um, but I, let's come back to that at the end of this little CEPI series because I don't think that they are, they're not quite answering that. Um, but, the, but again, so this is, in, you know, this is part of the, uh, the, the bottom line here is, is time. Uh, and ab above this is, again, from, from Nikki is the, you know, why it takes so long. You've got to find the thing. You've got to grow the virus. You have to do all these studies. And by the time, and not that they're not necessary, but they take a long time. And by the time you put it all together, you know, and maybe that the, the, the problem you're worried about is already swept through town um, for and, and left. So CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovations. Has anybody heard of this? Okay. So, so it's been around for a couple of years. Um, I think they're changing their name. I'm not sure. It seems that they don't like to, to say it. They, call, they, say, you know, they say CEPI, but they never spell it out anymore. And now they talk about, and you look at their website, new vaccines for a safer world. I think that, I, I don't know, I'm speculating, and sorry, Nikki, if I should have asked you this question before it goes on TV, <laughs> but, but anyhow, the point, is, the point is that the idea was putting an organization, an organization stood up to do, to solve, or at least to, to, to address this problem of getting a vaccine, if not ahead of the problem, closer to it. If the timelines are really long, their goal is to shorten the timeline by doing some of the front end stuff. That makes sense, and that's and that's what that's what they're working on. I think it's also interesting that to re, to look at this. It, it's not only a science project. It's about coordination of of the the range of vaccine players. It's about financing. Um, their focus again is on the vaccine development, the upstream. But as you'll see, it's it, there. It's not only about the vaccine, in the sense that that's their focus. But you have the vaccination part that's going to have to happen as well. So this, this is the again what their overall objectives are about uh, getting ahead of the problem and creating a system that is going to going to you know going to going to last. They're picking off a few of these uh, a few of these diseases, but the other point I think that that is important is that this is not just a science incubator. That this is you know it's, it, they're trying to organize all the sectors that have e have equities in here, and so they. You know, from the, again the discovery down to what was you know we'll talk a little about the last mile with Seppi both as a facilitator, an organizer of this, and as a funder of the of the science part of that. For which I don't know how much they've got. They they I should know. Half a billion dollars. There's some number that I'm, I'm not there. So I'm not. It's a I lot. Can't get your, but 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 it's a <laughs> lot. But it costs a lot. Um, I mean the the estimates are. And it's, the estimates are it costs a billion dollars to develop a vaccine, um, and part of that is when that 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 number often comes from an aggregate of maybe failed attempts because not everything makes it, um, but sometimes they're really they're really they're, it, it will be that for a single product and it takes a long time. So if you're going to use a billion dollars as a marker <coughs> and five to ten years, if you think about that, oh, that all diseases, right? So you got to narrow it down a little bit because that gets a little expensive. But when you think, of, and, and and if you're worried that um, uh, some of these diseases, some of these vaccines might or not work, you have to put multiple bets in because it might not work, and each one is going to be expensive. So while they have, a, there's a lot of money at play from a lot of places, um, they can only pick off several um, or a few of those as as it goes forward. Um, and the question is, is do people value this? Um, and we'll see how, how this goes over time, whether or not organizations like this are still going to be successful in getting the funding they need to advance the products that they have. So this is, this is what they've begun with. Um, the products that, that, that are their pathogens 
I don't know that the process by which they, they narrowed it down from the larger one, but it comes from the blueprint. Um, and then there is this disease X, which we'll get to. One of the recognitions in all this, and it was clear when we were, it was clear with every, with every vaccine and when we were doing this with, with pandemic influenza, is that uh, stockpiles, while a good idea in concept and are important for some diseases, stockpiles are not the easiest thing to maintain. It's not like having an oil stockpile when, when you have problems, you can drill into the ground and tap it out because the stockpile, you have to make sure that these products are st they're stable over time, they're safe to give over time. Um, it may be that they have something, if, they don't, if they're not gonna be stable in their form for a couple of years, you have to replenish them. And there's not a lot of appetite for throwing stuff out that you've paid a lot of money for, unless you view it as an insurance policy. So stockpiles is problematic. Um, even though they, they have a, they, they're necessary. The, what, one of the things that CEPI is moving to is what's really, really thinking about platform technology. Is there some, a platform is a, a, a technological approach to, to, the, to developing a vaccine. Um, is there some platform like that that, we, that can be used for multiple different, different products? And they look at that both from a pragmatic side of, well, you've got all the apparatus, you've got all the pieces, and also regulatory side, and probably the best example is influenza, where the influenza vaccine is made in the same places by the same people in the same way every year, and the only difference is the virus they put into it. So everything is the same. So sometimes that matters as far as the, the which virus they select because it may grow differently in one year versus another or in, do, in different systems. But as the FDA and others look at this, they say, well, we're pretty comfortable with that system. We know who's doing it, we know how it works, we know how to measure things. And so every year the influenza vaccine is made in these same systems and the FDA can approve it pretty quickly because they are comfortable and they've been doing this for 50 years with the process. There's not actually, for the annual, in the United States, for the annual influenza vaccine, there's not any human testing that is critical to the pathway for licensure each year. They just make sure the process is followed. There are some immunogenicity studies to make sure that it works, but it's not, because if you had to wait to do a clinical trial every year, you'd miss it because these things have to happen every year. So I think that that's the underlying principle of a platform that, that, that seems to work. Often people, the technology people tell us plug and play, that it, it's the same, you're just gonna change the virus. It's not quite that simple, but the idea is to look at different platforms to do this so that you don't have to retest every different type of platform. Uh, you're just changing it for, the, for the, the, the disease in question. And I won't get into it, but there are a number of different types of platforms that you can see here. And I think one of the things that CEPI, well, one of the things that CEPI is moving into now is to try to look at these technologies as platforms and not merely we want to have people design vaccines for these various diseases. So now we'll get into X. So um, did anybody go to the, to the Clade X exercise? Yeah. So, clade, so, this, so, so a clade is sort of a, this group of organisms with a common ancestor. And that's sort of the idea here is that it's this, this branch of the family that is problems. Sound familiar? Um, <laughs> and, and, um, and so therefore, clade X is, is a sort of an indication that some disease that you've never heard of before shows up and now you, have, now you have a big problem and you have to deal with it. So that's what this clade X is. I would encourage you to go to this, to take a look at this. It's all on the, it's all on the website um, and of, of uh, the, the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. So it's an, everything that they did, it was a day long exercise with pretty important people who, who played themselves often in their roles. And they, um, and they were challenged with something, and I won't, I won't spoil it, but they were challenged. But everything about it, about that exercise is available. The video injects, which they will, you're, you will cringe when you see them because you feel like you're watching the evening news and watch this outbreak unfolding. Um, the play-by-play -play of what people did and how people respond, the challenges they had amongst themselves about how you dealt with this and how, how you talk, how talked about it publicly and what you did and what you didn't do. So go go look at that, and that so because it's 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 so well done. Um, but but why, what's disease X all about? I mean, the principles here are that you know mo I, I thought the number was 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 closer to thir three quarters of infectious diseases are zoonotic in origin. 
but nevertheless, there's a lot, and that's where they come from. So animals have different viruses, uh, and sometimes when they <coughs> intersect with us, we get them. HIV is a, is a good example of that, and there are plenty of them. But, th but that's sort of where things are. And so this human inter animal interface and one health is really, you know, I think where the where the action is. Um, and so, and, and you see, we see this all the time. And there's no one's going to be surprised. Everyone's, everyone's surprised by what shows up. I don't think any a few people heard of Zika before it, but most people never heard of it. And a lot of people said, well, they they started with A with AIDS. Now they're at Z. So I guess we got it covered. <laughs> but it's amazing these things keep showing up because there are lots of viruses. Um, and it's, it's clear that while nobody knows what it is, something else will show up that we, that's unexpected. And the question then is, what are you going to do about it? Once you figure it out, then how are you going to protect people from it? And vaccines is clearly going to be one way for it. Um, and I think this is, a, this is again, a, a one of Nikki's slides. The point is, CEPI is focused on the front end of this. Their, their job is to take those candidates and, and work them up to the point where they look like they could be used in an emergency, and to your point, Mike, that they could be evaluated in that sense. So if you have a Ebola vaccine that's not licensed, but looks like it's safe, and looks like it's immunogenic, but, but based on whatever you think, then you can use it in a setting with a lot of care, um, and it is in those settings you can truly, or at least, at least hope to truly evaluate it, which is part of what's, what's going on now. Um, and there is the question of, is, of whether or not you could get it approved or licensed prior to that. So that's one of the that's one of the pieces of it. But I think the point is that just having the vaccine isn't enough. And there's the, 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 how it fits into the rest of the system. And remember Rube Goldberg there, because once you have the vaccine, then you have to think about every aspect of it, from how to get it to people and how to make sure people understand it and whether or not they take it and to measure what the impact is, both in good and bad. Because it could be that there is a problem that you couldn't detect when you were doing it in just a few people. So I think that while CEPI's focus is on the front end of this, the, you know, the back end is important. So I want to talk, well, I'll, I'll get to the last mile at the end. There's the last mile. But I just want to focus on a few pieces of the journey between the vaccine and that last mile. So there's this issue of biosecurity and biocontainment. So if you're working with some of these pathogens, it's not so simple, it's, it, it, it's not just a lab experiment. So there is the, select, people heard of select agents. So select, these are, the, these, are the, these are the things that are troublesome or worrisome if they got loose, we'll just put it that way. And, and they're, 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 they could be either be a problem for humans or for agriculture, which is why I have both the CDC, this is their, it's a combined exercise actually, with CDC and USDA of ensuring that people, depending on the pathogen in question, that, that people know how to handle it. So there are different types of laboratories that are approved to handle different pathogens. Um, and I only put that in the vaccine context because it doesn't make it easy. If you have some um, sort of category A pathogen, anthrax, botulism, plague, smallpox, tularemia, you've got to have special people in special places to handle it, and that's not often <coughs> amenable, or it's not so easy to, to work in those facilities if you're also going to try to be working on a vaccine. So there are these necessary constraints that are, that are put on for security, because um, it's not only that, that, that bad guys could do things like this, but there are lab accidents as well. So I think there is a, p a piece of that. So I, only, I put that here just to keep that in the context of that's, that's relevant to vaccine development. So another, I, I told you the story of when I got to HHS and, 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 and was given this title of a vaccine office. When I was at NIH in the late 80s, uh, in, the, in, the, in the mid 90s, um, there was a lot of attention on pandemic preparedness. So, so there was not, there, and again, there wasn't, there was a lot of science looking at this thing, but we didn't have a, a plan. And there was a discussion then about um, people who were going to go to the, to the Arctic to try to find the virus. And that's, that was going on. So, so the question then is, so if these people are going to be digging up graves of people who were, and there, the idea was that these people in the, in, the, in the permafrost are still preserved somehow, and there was the potential that you could, uh, you could retrieve virus from these, from these bodies. There's a lot of anthropology that went into this thing, because you can imagine people parachuting into some village and saying, by the way, we want to dig up your elders. Um, they were able to get past that. And there was a guy, um, who went, and this is one of these towns that most of the people died in 1918. There are a few orphans left, 
and some of those were still around and involved in making this decision because they remembered those days. So, mm -hmm. but there was a, there was a, this guy Johan Hulten, who had was a Swedish I don't know, scientist but explorer who had done a number of things. In the 50s, he went to Alaska to do some to do some some archaeology stuff. Uh, then then he went again and tried to to do this in the in the late 50s. And what I read was that there was some power failure in the dry ice melted or got wet or whatever happens to dry ice and whatever samples he retrieved didn't never materialized and then when there was new technology and there was interest Jeff Toppenberger at, uh, at then at the Armed Forces uh, Institute of Pathology and now at NIH had techniques where they could now retrieve these viruses they got in touch and this guy went up to Alaska to go do it again so I remember these discussions at NIH they said well shouldn't we make a vaccine to protect these people who are doing it and so they said, how do you do that? How do you make a vaccine for a virus you didn't know? And there was a long discussion of whether well, maybe you could find something that was close. This was an H1N1, so we could do something close. And there was, a, there was a serious discussion that basically fizzled because it seemed unlikely to be able to do it. How would you make sure this vaccine was safe? Who would you give it to? And a whole lot. So, so that never happened. But this guy still went up there, and he and his team wearing face masks found corpses that they hadn't found the last time. And from that came one of the samples that Jeff used to then sequence the, the virus. So there was even, in that point, because if you think about the biosecurity aspects of people going there and doing what they were doing, and the idea that this virus could now get loose again um, by their sampling techniques. So there's also the, I call it legal preparedness. Um, and I'll, I'll go back to the, to the 1976 um, swine flu. So in 1976, there was this concern that there was going to be a new a pandemic. Um, and there was a lot of dabbling about what to do about it. And the vaccine manufacturers said, and there was because there was a virus that was retrieved, um, and, there was a, and there was a concern that it was going to take off. So the vaccine manufacturers started making vaccine, but basically said, you can't use it unless we're protected, because they didn't really know. It's a, it was a new, a new kind of vaccine, and they didn't know whether or not there were some problems with it. And so they said, um, well, you can't, you, you can't use it unless we're protected because you give this to millions of people and something bad happens, we're sunk. And because and we can't tell you that it's safe and effective because we don't, we haven't done it. So what was, what was ironic was that at the same time, I have it here, there was a, um, people heard of Legionnaire's disease. There was an outbreak in Philadelphia of what then became known as Legionnaire's disease because it was a convention of Legionnaires. So, yeah, so, uh, so, so in the middle of this summer in Washington, with all this posturing and going nowhere, are these headlines about um, this outbreak at a hotel among American legions and veterans of pneumonia. And because there was discussion of swine flu, of, of, of the emergence of flu at that time, it sort of got mistaken. And they said, Jesus, well, this is it. And so it was because of this Legionnaires outbreak that Congress passed a law to protect vaccine manufacturers. So, you know, this, it, these things work. As you wind the clock forward, there was another, rule, another law passed called the PREP Act, which is the Public Health Readiness and Emergency Preparedness Act. There's a lot more to it, but among the things was that if manufacturers are gonna step up and there's some product that's involved in responding to a, a threat and there's an, and different parameters about it, then the government will step in and help to protect them from liability because otherwise the companies were a huge risk and, 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 and even though they have deep pockets, there was, nobody's got these kind of deep pockets, given the potential problems and given you know, our you know, ability to litigate. Um, and this is used periodically. Uh, it was used with Zika as well, because you can think of the same, for the same sets of issues, if you have a virus that can do bad things, how can you be sure that a vaccine doesn't them, it might not do them as well? So the PREP Act is put in place a number of times for these public health emergencies. And there's a program within HHS now, it's called the, it's called the Countermeasures Injury Compensation Program, a parallel to the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program that's set up for this, this same reason. So again, legal preparedness. I call it ethical preparedness because you know, this could fall in any camp. But the question then is if you have a certain, if you have a big problem and a certain amount of vaccine, who gets to go to the front of the line? So this is an exercise that we did, and it's been revisited a little bit with pandemic influenza because essentially everybody on the planet, and for the U.S. purposes, everybody in the U.S. is at risk. 
and you're going to only have so much vaccine initially, so who gets to go in line first? Um, I will tell you that there's a lot of interest in this. Um, a letter that we got from the International Association of Family Bread Makers tried to make the argument that bread is a staple of mankind and therefore bread makers were in a special position and they should be protected. My response, which, they, which is the good part, was then they stopped asking me to write these letters. Their response was, man does not live by bread alone. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of interest in this because everybody wants to be at the front of the line. And so this is, just know that this is out there. It's, it's, a, it's, a, way, it's a very elaborate scheme, and, I'll, I, and I use those words intentionally, about who would go first. And there was a combination of looking at people in high, who are high-risk populations because they have medical problems, occupational groups, people who are, are, are important for health security, and this whole, you know, just trying to think of who would fit in which box. Um, what I think is probably important about this is if you look at who's last in line, it's mostly people who, are, who are, have med medical problems. The reverse of what you do with normal immunization rec recommendations, um, because the purpose of trying to keep society going, um, at the same time you're trying to protect people. There's a longer, a longer episode on this one. We did town hall meetings around the country to try to get people's values and came up with this. I will say that while this is interesting, um, the problem that we still have is that this is not executable because nobody knows that they're in these categories. And if something were to happen, how are you going to prove that somebody who's some nuclear power worker or somebody who clears checks for the Fed or whatever they do deserves to be in some line? And how are you going to manage that? Because, you know, who, who are you going to check for that? Um, go ahead. I'm asking it, uh, so I, I remember this, remember all these discussions very clearly. And, but they, if I remember correctly, they didn't translate to any vaccine that we would donate internationally. So right. that's a, right. It did, it did. So this is about how you would manage the U.S. population. There's a separate discussion about international, which I'll get to. Um, but so the question is, how would you pull this off? And there were all kinds of things. You would have people give people special IDs or God knows what, but you couldn't. You can't. You couldn't figure out. You still can't figure out how to do this mm -hmm. in a complex society. And just imagine if you pre-identified people in a work setting. To say, oh, you get to go first, and you, sorry, you know, you can come, you know, a couple <laughs> months later. Um, a whole range of issues with that, which makes this important, but still problematic, where we do execute it. It's less of a problem if you got a lot of vaccine. Mm -hmm. When you have a short, when you have a short supply, is when you have to put, put some of this in place, which is, again argues for if you could get a vaccine in front of these pro in front of a problem like this, you have a, you could potentially have a much bigger supply than if you're being responsive. Um, so, Jimmy, diplomatic preparedness, this is your job. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of, uh, you, uh, actually, I should have you guess what this means, because there are probably 50 things that are in your mind now, what, dip, what this could be. So I'm going to give you one example of it, and I call it diplomatic. So the, in bird flu days, um, there was a b problems with, with, with viruses, with, with disease in Indonesia and Vietnam, and um, then came this revelation that from the Minister of Health saying, listen, we're giving you our viruses, but we're never going to see these vaccines, so we're going to stop playing. And so here you have a system where this, the assumption is open sharing of viruses for risk assessment and then to try to do something about it. And their, their take was, you know, why, why, mess with, why should we do this? And they basically, she wrote a book about it, um, and, and, I, and, they, and it got global attention. And this is, this is an example of a much larger problem about sharing viruses and whether or not viruses are owned by the country where the bird or the person lived and what that means for national, national or is there something called viral sovereignty. And it led to a four-year, I think, series of negotiations. And I don't know how people have the appetite for this, and this is why people are diplomats, because they're diplomatic. But that, but this, this what's called the Pandemic Influenza Preparedness Framework, which is essentially this guarantee, if you will, that um, if you share viruses, we will share benefits, because the uh, because it's so important. It's complicated, but that's the that's the, at the heart of it. Um, and the question is how well it's working, and who monitors it, and what are those benefits? Clearly, among the benefits would be access to vaccine. The benefits could also be you participate in a research project, we build a laboratory in your area. There's a, there are a number of different things there could be, but there's a, a, a system here that's now been in place for, I don't know, eight or nine years that is, that is trying to 
do this. They have to track the viruses as they go from place to place because they want to make sure that viruses are being shared and that, and that people see that there's a system. It's quite complex, but th there's only anything like this for influenza. And there, I just put this down that there's, a, there's another larger issue about other viruses for which there are lots um, that fall into the same issue and, and whether or not people who have um, the viruses that they can dis distri distribute to others, whether they're going to get something for it. So vaccination preparedness, you know, so to, 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 to have a, to be able to, be able to protect people, you have to have a vaccine and then you have the vaccination part. And this is where I'll get Rebecca to your part. So in 2009 is this whole question about um, the U.S. had done a, a great job of being self-interested. And part of the reason that the U.S. Had, had, had done this was the experience from 10 years before when in 2004 we had, we, as a country, had two only two manufacturers supplied to the U.S. market, and one of them was, had a contamination, so we were stuck with one. And I remember vividly when this happened because it was on October 5th when... Um, when, when we got the news of this, and I know that because that was our anniversary and dinner plans got scrubbed. <laughs> so if ever you need an alibi for why you can't go to your anniversary dinner, this was it. Um, but so, 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 in, so then there was this problem in the U.S. that our vaccine supply, which is probably 120 million doses a year for seasonal flu, got cut to 60, and big problem. So that was why the U.S. invested so heavily in, in, in influenza vaccine for both seasonal and for pandemic preparedness, so we were in very good shape, but the rest of the world was not. And part of this was that the rest of the world either had manufacturing facilities in their country or had contracted manufacturers, and essentially every dose was tied up. So that meant there was little for the many, many, many who hadn't gotten into the game. So then came this whole question about would we donate our vaccine? What, what would we do with that? How would we help that problem? And among the more interesting discussions I was involved in, and John Monahan was part of that, was these discussions um, at the White House of, well, how are we going to play this? You know, the, and you have the, I'll paraphrase it, you know, the, the domestic policy people saying, you know, we're going to have a shortage, we're going to have long lines, um, and those people don't vote. It's not quite a quote, but that's the, that's the sentiment. Um, and, the, and the global people are saying, hey, listen, this is a global community, this is a pandemic, we have to help. And this, this decision actually went to the president of what to do. And the decision was we would, um, we would donate to WHO 10% of our supply um, if countries were able to use it. And because they didn't want it, you don't, you, you don't, you, the last thing you wanted was a shortage here and some sitting on a dock somewhere rotting. So that there had to be some guarantee that it was likely to be used and useful. And the other piece about giving it to WHO was let them figure out where it goes because this is one where, you know, you pick your friends or pick your enemies. That it's like the same situation of who's in who's in the front of the line. Yeah, this is this is not a winning winning recipe here. So WHO took this one on to develop what they called their deployment program of a vaccine that was donated not by the U.S. not only by the U.S. by many others. And so here you have it. So and this probably happens every time there's an emergency. People step up to the plate. They donate a lot of stuff. The gray bars are what actually happens versus what's promised. I don't know. How does this fare with normal pledges and emergencies? So is this good, bad? Well, I think it's good, especially since uh, what's this consistent across. Yeah. Because yeah. often there's the panic and neglect uh, aspect <laughs> right. of the donation. Yeah. Well. So, so at least it came through. And, there, and, and while there was a huge global need, and this was uh, you know, maybe a drop in the ocean, at least it was happening, and uh, it was a goodwill effort to do it. You know, so that so part of this was the the, the idea that there be you know, the vaccine be useful and used. So the WHO had a number of preconditions. They had the countries had to say that they wanted it. Makes sense. They had to have some a letter of agreement. And including the letter of agreement was um, that the country would be responsible for any liability. And that was a stickler for many. Um, and people didn't know what to do with that. There's some we, that's a that's probably a separate seminar that you should have. But that was part of, part of this whole issue related to the, 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 the situation in 1976 of would manufacturers do this because they're at risk. And then there had to, the countries had to actually show that they had a plan to use it because, you, again, you didn't want to ship it somewhere where it sat around because it could be useful somewhere else.
So this is where you can't make this stuff up. So, so, um, so while the United States was, we were, we were and the, most of the West who had vaccination programs were able to begin in October when vaccine was first available, countries didn't really start to see it until December and January. And again, this is where the virus, the vaccine came way late. And then a lot of bumps in the road. Um, the, and who would believe that in the middle of all this, do you remember the volcano in Iceland? So that stopped air traffic. So all the, so these, vac these vaccines are loaded up and they have, they're have temperature sensitive and all of a sudden the air traffic stops. So then what do you do with that? Not simple. So, that, so, it's, so I just found it ironic and amusing that the volcano gets in the middle of all this stuff because that was reality. Um, so let me get to the last mile. So we talked about sort of the front end of this. We talked about a lot of things, and I just gave you snapshots of the many pieces of that journey along the way and the last mile. So this is a, you know, I, I mentioned before, you saw in the last one about when, um, when the, the, the rest of the world, the developing world, first saw vaccines. Here's the way it played on the United States where we were chasing it. We, we, the, the pandemic was declared in April. Vaccine was, the process was begun immediately. Um, and um, with the, w and the first doses were available in early October, which is way too late. Tom Frieden, who was the director of the CDC, used to look at this and joke, says, well, there's about a half an hour in there, we got it right. <laughs> um, but, that, but again, it just demonstrates that if you want the, and there was, it had plenty of effect because the virus continued to circulate later, later on and in other places, but you, know, you, you, didn't, you weren't gonna catch the first wave of this in, in North America, so that's a big problem. So that's, so again, trying to get the, uh, the vaccine ahead of the, ahead of the, the virus. So the part of the last mile is, is at, at the very last, the end of the last mile, will people show up? Um, so this is in, 19, in 1947 in New York City. It's an incredible story. And think about measles as I tell you this story. But so somebody traveling from Mexico on a bus to New York City gets sick in New York City and dies. Only after he dies do they realize he died of smallpox. So now you're some health person and think, Jesus, where has this guy been? Who's been on the bus? Where is he? So now you have New York City um, trying to vaccinate people in the city who had not been vaccinated for smallpox before. And amazingly, in New York, people stood in line in long, I mean, it's, I guess they're used to standing in lines in New York, but not that long a line, and they, maybe being that patient. Um, it's also interesting, if you go back, and I, I, I talked to Peggy Hamburg about this recently, what I hadn't realized is that there was, the, there's, a, there's a, an NPR piece, the mayor of New York at the health commissioner in New York went on the radio to plead with people to get vaccinated and said, I know that a lot of people are scared of it. I know that some of you, he may have been used, I think he used the word resistant and not hesitant, but you know, what's new? Here is a guy trying to say, we got a big problem here. We have this potential catastrophe in New York City. Please, if you haven't been vaccinated, go get vaccinated from the health, from the health commissioner. So, so, we, so you know, that, that's the question. If you go to all this you know, effort, will people show up? Has, has ever, have everybody seen this before? So this is a cartoon from 1800, um, and this is depicting smallpox. And this is supposed to be Edward Jenner. And so if you, this is like when your kid highlights magazine. I don't know if they still have highlights magazine. Look, we used to look for squirrels in the tree. Now look for things that look like cows, because this was the concern that these vaccines were creepy and could do bad things, and the bad things would happen, and the idea that you would turn into a cow because they were from cows. So the movement of, of, against vaccines and concern of the vaccines is not new. It's been around since there have been vaccines. Um, and this concept of vaccine hesitancy. I think that's, it, it's, uh, it's another, another discussion. I think, I think a lot of times the vaccine hesitancy, and particularly in this new cycle, is equated with the anti-vax movement. And I think that there is, there's an element of that. Uh, these are people who don't like vaccines no matter what flavor they are or anything about them. There's, it's a conspiracy, they're dangerous. Um, but for, and, but for me, most people, it's the, it's the social norm. But increasingly, as people see this and they, they can't quite figure out what, what, what makes sense, and everybody's trying to do what's best for their child, they get confused and they say, well, maybe I'll wait. And because these diseases have largely gone away, they think, I think I'm going to wait a while. Hence, you know, you have problems, but like we're seeing now with measles, but this is really a continuum. <coughs> um, and I think hesitancy often gets 
missed, it, it's too broad a category because everything, every reason somebody is not vaccinated is swept, is, it's turned into the parent's fault somehow. And it's not only, I mean, it's, it could be that, but there's a lot more to the system. So the people who look at this now, and again, just to give you a teaser for here, there are a lot of things that go on with people not being vaccinated. Do you have confidence in the system? Do you, you know, do you have some concerns about it? Is it convenient? Can you pay for it? There are a lot of things that go on that lead to people not to be vaccinated, not just that they're anti-vax. So I think that it's really important because I think that all this discussion has given the anti-vaccine movement way too much credit and putting more wind in their sails than they deserve because there are lots of things, people, and people have questions about everything and they should get answered. Um, sometimes they're complicated, but I think that there, there are good answers to every question about it. So I'll just end with this. This is from t yesterday. Um, and so this is what's, 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 what's going on now. Um, and you know, only a vaccine is gonna get us out of this because measles is the most contagious virus of all. And if you are if not immune, meaning if you not, have not had measles or if you've not been, been immunized effectively um, and you're near somebody with measles, your chance of getting measles is what? Give me a number. Ten, what? 90%. 90%. Higher or lower? It's 90%. Yeah. And not, so not only is it, so the 90% is... the med is, student, so, right? But I, yeah. I, just kidding. I mean, if you can't get that one right, you know. But, 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 but the other piece of it, so this is an airborne virus. You know, it's a rash, but the, it's really a respiratory virus. It's a, it's a virus of linings. So it's, an, it's, it's a respiratory virus, and the virus lingers. The number is between two and four hours. How long? The, the, what, are they, what are they teaching you? How long? Two hours, that's the rule. I, so I used, to, I used to, but basically it'll linger. So if you're susceptible to measles and you walk into a room that somebody two hours before was coughing, mm -hmm. there's a 90% chance you'll get measles. When I was an ID fellow in New York City in the 90s, <clears throat> um, there was a measles outbreak. And I got called by hospital infection control because there was a concern that somebody that went through the emergency room and then visited somebody in the cancer ward had measles. And so from a hospital infection standpoint, they said, this is going to be a huge problem. So I get, true story, I get dispatched by ambulance to go to the Bronx to go find this person to see whether or not they had measles. I, so I thought I knew what measles was. I had it as a kid. All of my friends had it. But, you know, this is a tough call. I took every dermatology book in the library <laughs> with me in this ambulance just to make sure I saw everything and went to this place by ambulance, you know, flashing, you know, flashing lights and sirens to go find some kid who had a bug bite. And so they didn't have to go through the drill that they'd otherwise have to go through at New York Hospital had that person had measles and been where they were. That's my story, that's the bell. <laughs> okay, thanks. Wow. Um, I, I know it's nine. I know some of you have to run off to class, but are you willing to like take some questions? Oh, for sure. I, it's go if you have to, or so, want to. So I mean, I, can I? Yeah, yeah. So what do you think of the, what do you think of the decision by the New York City Mayor? What's what's, what's I mean, the, the, the so yeah, this is the yeah. mandatory vaccination and or fine or, fine, or, or yeah. Fine. Um. So, I, I so this is a uh, this is a. A, a very contagious disease, mm -hmm. and it's 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 a risk to people who are who are otherwise not immune. And there are plenty of reasons you, that you're not immune. You could be too young, or you could have an immune compromise. So trying to protect people. So the goal is to try to keep people who are vulnerable away from people who could be spreading it. Um, and I, th I think the biggest problem is when the the mandatory word whenever you use it is radioactive, but trying to implement some kind of control. I think the question is going to be, this is a good one to track to try to see what the implication is. Um, it, it's, you know, for a long time, I mean, there's a long history of court cases of requiring vaccination, starting with smallpox, to protect the larger society. And, it, and this is, this is the, the classic. Would I have done that? I'm not sure. I would have tried to do a little more cajoling before that. I don't know what they had tried before that. Um, but I think that, that that ends up giving you such a backlash that it, it, it might increasingly polarize an issue for political reasons and not for health reasons. What, are, what do others think? I mean, well, I, we're, we're a biased audience, right? 
close, I am. <laughs> I mean, so the, the public health community, it's easy to be able to cite 1903 and Jacobson, and the vaccinating. Right, right. Um, I, I, I'm, I, I'm interested to see what the fallout looks like. Um, I wonder. I wonder what the court cases might look like. I wonder what happens, and I just I, I'm nervous about the current environment, um, and uh, if if there is backlash on the public health. Uh, I, I think that this is, and maybe this is a great topic across the board for people to look at. I, I think that another another backlash is, and I don't know exactly what's what's happening in the social media platforms, because mm -hmm. um, that's another one where you know you want to dampen it down a little bit, but at, at some point it's a <laughs> if, you, if you escalate a, a freedom of speech aspect to that, that is problematic as well. I was mentioned to Maeve that I saw um, that what WhatsApp, not vaccine, but WhatsApp is, has been in response to the election in India, where apparently WhatsApp is driving the, you know, the, all the noise is driving that election. Um, you know, th they've had similar requests, I think, about how to tamp this down. What they're doing, I read in an article, but I don't know exactly how they're doing, is there's some system where if you see something that you think is suspicious, you report it somewhere, and that somewhere we then will we'll look at it and send you a note saying this is true, false, misleading, or something. I don't know how they're doing that. Because I think it's another fascinating experiment to see what that, I mean, and they'll be able to, because they know what everybody's talking about, but they'll be able to follow to see what kind of what, what that does. Does that help things? Does it make it worse? I don't know. But I, I, I worry, like you, that move, moves like this move away from the health and move into politics, and it's a different, a different sphere. But, you know, watch this one, because this is, it's, you know, the New York City is obviously getting a lot of media attention on this, but, but every health official in the country is worried it's going to come to their neighborhood because they're going to have, they, they could see the same problem. And I think there's also just states being laboratories of trying to pass different laws right. that make vaccinations mandatory or make it harder to get religious exemptions or conscious right. ex exemptions as a way to try to motivate. But there is that problem of where are you, where do you become big brother government coming between you and your doctor or you and your religion and where are you actually looking right. out for the broader no, that's right. And, and, and Jim and I were talking about this before, but this is not just a U.S. state issue. This is happening around the world where people face with, again, measles is because it's so contagious and so obvious because you can see it, this is the, 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 really the litmus test that politicians around mm -hmm. the world are looking at the same thing because they're under the same kinds of pressures. And so there have been, been similar kinds of m moves and it's sort of like a how, what, what is the, what is the recommendation from, from recommendation to mandate to how you're going to enforce that? Are you going to take people away from their family? I mean, the whole yeah. range of things that could happen, but I think it's going to be a similar one. And so this is a, a phenomenon that's going to be worth watching. It's, it's worth, so this, um, the, the mandate, the mandates in the United States is relatively new. It's only, I think in the, since the seventies. And it happened in Los Angeles, it started in Los Angeles when there was a measles outbreak, yet again, and they couldn't, and, and because of the incubation period, they kept closing schools, and the superintendent of schools said, this is crazy. So they got together with the health commissioner and said, okay, we gotta do something about it, and this no shots, no school started there, and got, and said, you know, they gave people two weeks to get vaccinated or stay home, and that was the beginning of, in the U.S., the school-based requirements. Oh, free. Not without charge, right? Without charge. I mean, like the, so, vaccine. It's, so you're taking out one of those aspects of like, is it? Can you afford it? Can you afford it? Yeah. I I, I don't. I assume that yeah. they, that in, in that era they they would have probably public clinics. Okay. Now in the United States, here's another quiz question. Medical students gone. What percentage of vaccine in the United States is paid for for children? Is paid for by the government for children? What percentage of children get free vaccine? No idea. Number. Five? Ninety? What do you think? A hundred? hundred percent, no. 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 no, no not insurance, not private insurance, but the federal government pays to buy vaccine, to distribute it to pediatricians' offices or to health clinics, so that people who otherwise would, would, would have a, ba a barrier to being vaccinated because of cost. So you're including Medicaid in there? Uh, well, it's, it's a program called the Vaccine for Children program. So that's so that's. No so what percentage? In the United States. So last quiz question. 40. I think it's fifty-five. 
it's above, it's above, it, that's, it, so, and, and, the, and I don't know all the criteria for what counts for the vaccine for children program. You have to be less than 18. Uh, so that's a, a, a bar, um, you know, at some poverty level or some group that's been de de defined as, uh, as vulnerable and having access problems, it's huge. And when, and, and I'll, I'll end with this, but this, at the CDC, they vote on vaccine recommendations. When it's a vaccine recommended for somebody under 18, they have a separate vote for whether or not vaccine should be re recommended for the vaccine for children program. Mm -hmm. So this group of outside experts that comes to Atlanta three times a year and makes billion dollar votes mm -hmm. about what vaccines should be given because those votes, then mm -hmm. the government has to, if they vote that it should be, and then ultimately the government decides um, but that so like MMR versus HPV. HPV yeah, probably yeah. HPV doesn't make it. No, HPV makes it if you're less than 18. If you're 20, if you're 26, you know it doesn't qualify. But uh, less than less than 18. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is there, which is why it's an expensive program. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'll, I know you have to go. So I'll hang around a little bit for other questions. But thanks for thank thanks you for again. Doing this. Thanks for coming. Yeah, great.